This morning, they are here to tell their amazing and heroic story. Could we please welcome to the stage Kelly, Lisa, and Linda. Welcome back. <laughs> so this year I began, to, we, we've had some donors and I just began to feel very compelled to go. It was time to go and follow up what would have been done so far. I felt responsible for these donors. And um, so we, I started planning the trip. And at first it was just me. I was just going to go by myself. I didn't really want to go by myself, but I thought, okay, I can do this. <laughs> and then Lisa said, I want to go. And then Linda said, I want to go. And then I'm sitting in the dentist chair one day, and I tell my dentist about it, and she's like, I want to go. <laughs> so uh, she came along, and the four of us planned the trip and decided to leave on January 12th. And um, I have this very long list of goals that I was going to accomplish on that trip. Things like I want to talk to Pastor Val about long-term things, uh, setting up sponsorship program, taking computers, doing a little computer training, um, having a party for the kids, blah, blah, blah. Long list of goals, okay? But let me read the scripture to you. <laughs> Proverbs 19:21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So <laughs> we land in the airport on Tuesday at five o'clock. A little before five, I guess. Pastor Val finally shows up. We had like a mob of porters ready to help us with our luggage. And uh, Pastor Val finally gets there and we load the things in the car. And he runs back into the airport to pick up an extra bag for someone else. And while we're sitting in the car under some trees, away from all the buildings, which is very key, we start feeling the, the car shake. And we thought, oh, those porters are on the back of the car. That was the first thing that ran through my mind. They're jumping on the car trying to get some money, you know. But it's more and more, and, and I'm bouncing out of the chair. And the, <laughs> I was like a, a ride at, the, at Disney World, you know? And the trees in front of us are violently shaking back and forth. And it went on and on and on, 45 seconds. And there was an old man standing there with us that had been a missionary in Haiti for 30 years, and he said, I have never seen this before, never. We looked up in the hills, and there was a dust cloud just rising from the city. Um, so, of course, we realized it was an earthquake. Finally, Pastor Val comes running out of the airport, shaking. I mean, this man is 68 years old, shaking and sweating and eyes as big as saucers. He said, the ceiling was falling, and everyone was falling down, and I fell down, and I, I got up, and I got out, and I'm like, what are we going to do? You know, he was really upset. So that was the beginning of the trip. What inspired you to be a part of the Kelly's team? I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she, she just said, I'm going, and she said, I'm going by myself, and I just heard the Lord say, go. Okay. So I really went as Kelly's assistant, <laughs> <laughs> um, but really I did go because I wanted to see the orphanage, and I wanted to go sure. and, and minister and help her minister to the children, so that really was why I went. So was, you heard, but you heard the Lord yes, speak to you to, to, to in go. your heart to go. To yeah. go. And Linda, how about you? Well, Kelly said that originally she had two people lined up to go, and I was at her house, and um, she said, I had two people lined up to go. I just feel like I'm supposed to go, but these people backed out. And I said, I really feel like I'd like to go with you on this trip. It just seemed like the Lord immediately said, you're supposed to be there. And was that a long time ago? Or, or? No, it was maybe, well, it was the weekend of the reunion. So that was the weekend before Thanksgiving. Okay. Wow. So, so you just kind of made plans and got your mm -hmm. visa or whatever right. you needed. And so you joined, so there was the four of you. Right. So the four of you were out in the car, and you were in, you were in the earthquake, okay? Mm -hmm. So w was that your first earthquake, or? Well, <laughs> my family has been, Wayne and I, have been in all the cities of all the major earthquakes. He was in seminary during the uh, L.A. earthquake. We were in Japan during Kobe. We were in China last year during Chengdu. <laughs> and here I am. Someone said, do the earthquakes follow you, or do you follow the earthquakes? You know, Honestly, um, I don't know, but I'll let you know my travel plans next time. That's, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> it's very gracious of you. I'm thinking about escorting you out of the building. <laughs> right, right. Well, you can be but, sure um, that where I am, there's no destruction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And second thought, we want you to stay. Right. You um, want me here. <laughs> but isn't it amazing, Kelly, that the Lord, without you knowing, has sent you an earthquake specialist? <laughs> oh, believe me, Linda's a specialist in a lot of things. <laughs> and we're going to hear about that, uh, I'm sure. So, okay, so what happened after you, it was, it's been, uh, the news 
that, that's, that your husband's is that you gals set up in a soccer field there. Well, and we really didn't know where to go. Um, we, we were really at Pastor Val's mercy because it was chaos. You know, the, the drive from the airport anywhere was just, the streets were filled with people. Uh, probably one of the most impressionable things that happened to us right then was we saw um, a naked woman who had just rushed out of the shower and grabbed a hand towel. So she's trying to have some dignity in the street, you know, sitting and she's got this little towel. And we just started opening our suitcases and pulling clothes out and throwing them at people. You know, they needed what yeah. we had. I mean, we had a car full of supplies for an orphanage. So, you know, we had, we had what we wanted, you know, what we could share. And so he said, we're going to this church. So he took us to a church, took us about an hour to get from the airport to the church. And um, it was pitch black. Uh, and he just said, this is going to be a safe place. The people were about to have a church service. There were 2,000 people all dressed up, had their Bibles. And that to him, that was the safest place to go. But the people in the church said, we can't stay here. This is not safe. Right. So they said, we're walking to this field. So he, he assured us it was a 30-minute walk and we could do it. So we, we grabbed up a few things and we began to walk. It was not a 30-minute walk. <laughs> it was about an hour and a half in the pitch black. Um, mm. Didn't know where we were going, power lines. It was, it was scary. Uh, we finally got to this field and we went in there. But I have to tell you, the story you are not hearing on the news is that the people of Haiti collectively began to worship God. And mm. that field... <laughs> that field was full of these 2,000 precious Christians sitting in little groups all around the field, worshiping the Lord. We probably arrived at about 8 o'clock at night. Yeah, here we go. Uh, arrived at 8 o'clock that night probably, and it was already very dark by then. And um, no one had any lights or any blankets or anything. We were just on the grass in our clothes. And little groups would, one group would pick up a song, and there would be a worship leader, and they would sing with her or him. And then someone would say something, and there would be a responsive kind of scripture response and then somebody would start praying loudly and 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 praying in the spirit and, and then someone else would pick up a song and this went on until the sun came up and when the sun oh and then during the night every time there was a tremor and there was a lot of those and when you're laying on the ground you feel every one of them every time there was a tremor we heard hallelujah praise the lord jesus is king and, and they're shouting against these tremors like a weapon it was incredible so all night, this Amen. was our experience. So we were at peace like I have never experienced in my life in the midst of that chaos. And in the morning, a whole worship service took place. Everybody gathered in one spot on that field and began to worship the Lord. Great. Which one of you want to share the, some of the triage and, and, the, and the medical? Well, day two. We woke up from the field and people immediately began to pick up their little sheets and their things and bundle them up and walk off. So we sat around for a minute and thought, what should we do? We asked Pastor Val. We said, we'd really like to go back and see if our vehicle is there. We didn't know if it had been looted, what had happened with it, but we had 400 pounds of supplies in the wow. vehicle and we wanted to go check this out. So we went back to the church. Our vehicle was untouched. Uh, Kelly's suitcase had $700 in cash just sitting right there in the front seat window and everything was untouched and so the Lord just watched over all of it. We gathered um, some things up and, and we loaded ourselves back in the vehicle and we attempted to drive again to Kiskeya but Pastor Val just felt so comfortable back on the soccer field. So we drove back to the soccer field and parked on the perimeter and the minute the car turned off people came in droves. We were the only foreigners on the field and they said, you know, come see my mother, come see my sister, help my daughter, help oh my me. God. I mean, people came missing legs with broken, twisted appendages. I mean, it was unimaginable. And we had a box of Band-Aids and a tube of Neosporin and 25 pounds of latex gloves. <laughs> so the Lord just multiplied that Neosporin and, and multiply those band-aids and I, you know in retrospect we say what is it what good is it to put a band-aid on an amputated foot but the Lord was there and we prayed over these people and in a few moments a man came up and I think this is the story that a lot of people are asking about and he said my wife is in labor and 
immediately, we said, we're not qualified. And he said, no, come, my wife is in labor. There was a hospital across the street, and all of the personnel had abandoned it. They were overwhelmed. They were completely out of everything. There was nothing they could do, and they walked away. And he said, you have to come. And we kept saying, we're not qualified. And finally, I said, okay, I have had a baby. I can do this. <laughs> We had Kelly's pinking shears. We had fabric, which I said, I'm going to need some strips cut. i got to tie off umbilical cords. So I said, I need some of those rubber gloves, and I need some alcohol preps to wipe down the cord. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I said, all right, Lord, I've had a baby. We can, we can get there. So I took Julia, the dentist, thinking, of course, she's had medical training. And so <laughs> we oh, walked man. across the street, and... and Okay, I just, it's a sobering thing. When we walked onto the hospital campus, it was a sobering thing. That's where people had dragged their sick, their injured, and their deceased. And I stepped over piles of children mm -hmm. to get to that room. The only room that was not piled high with sick and injured was the delivery room. And, and again, it was very sobering because every person I passed with their last breath would grab my arm and say, help. And I had to peel their arms off. I knew I couldn't help. So I prayed. I just said, God, you're the great physician. Heal them or take them quickly, please. And I just passed through just praying. You know, this is when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the only thing that we have. So we walked into this room. And I kid you not, the minute I walked in the door, pregnant women started crawling out of the woodwork. And they came into that room, and my eyes were open. And Julia, who has not yet made an open and public statement of faith, grabbed my hands and said, we cannot do this. We better ask for God's help. She said, Jesus, help us. Oh, my. And with the help of the Lord and with a lot of prayer, we began to minister to these women. And so... Um, the, the interesting thing, again, that everyone is asking me about, yes, the first baby was in an unusual position. The baby was this way, head over here, buttocks over here, nowhere near it where it was supposed to be. And in my very, very poorly remembered French, I said to this woman, this is going to be very difficult, but I have God. And so she was a screamer, and I said, no, 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 no. Take a deep breath and say, hallelujah. <laughs> and so she did. She was so obedient. She hallelujahed and hallelujahed and hallelujahed. And Julia said, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, well, I can't do a C-section. She said, the only thing I can do is suturing. And I said, well, we got no sutures. So I put my hand on the woman's stomach, and I said, I declare that you will line up in the name of Jesus and be born. And in front of our eyes, the baby went, whoop. Yes, hallelujah. So, I'll briefly wrap this, this bit up. Oh, this is a picture. Yes, this is, in fact, that baby. It's a girl. They asked our names. That child is probably named some form of Julia Linda, Linda Julia. I don't know. But um, then the second baby was the baby of the man who had come to get us. He's a pastor in Santo Domingo, and his name is St. Mark. That's him actually standing there. His name is St. Mark, and he said, now help my wife. It's time to help my wife. And, and we helped her out, and they had a baby boy, and they were so thrilled. And, and by the grace of God, we cut the cords. We did it right. We <laughs> disinfected what we could. The room was in just a pitiful shape. But then St. Mark said, I would like for you to name my baby. And I thought, wow. Okay. So I just I said, let me pray for a minute. And I just thought about it, and I said, okay, I have the name. I said, we came through so much coming in here. We stepped over death. We stepped over injury. We walked through destruction. I said, but I want to name him Judah, because Judah means praise. I said, we'll leave this, pray, this place with the praise of God on our lips. So awesome. there is a Judah out there. My, my, my. Linda, this is just unbelievable. Um, I guess we're going to give you an honorary OB degree, huh? That's right. I will be waiting in the wings over there. <laughs> if you have any babies. I like that. That's a new Lamaze right there, the hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's great. I That'll actually be... had Julia doing it, too. She had a woozy moment. I said, do your Lamaze. <laughs>
That's excellent. Lisa, what was, where were you in all this? Were you in the delivery ward also? No. <laughs> um, Kelly and I were back together at the soccer field. Were you the ones that had the Band-Aids and mm. the Bacitracin and a little pair of scissors because she had the big scissors to do surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and we had two helpers, two um, Haitian boys that could speak English barely. I speak no French. Kelly does pretty well. But these two young men interpreted for us and people were just bringing, as Linda said, just they're, they're wounded. And just, it was awful really, but we did what we could. We, we prayed for them and these young men would, um, um, you know, interpret for us. And we, that little tube of bacitracin lasted and we would squirt a little bit on a little piece of fabric mm -hmm. and they would have a whole body practically covered with cuts and things. And so we just really just ministered through prayer and um, just prayed for their healing. That's wonderful, That's Lisa. Really Amazing. You know, so all this is going on on Wednesday morning and uh, by the time they came back uh, covered in afterbirth, um, and to get something to drink, we were like, surely it's, must, the sun's going to go down here soon. It was 11.30 in the morning. And I, I have to say, that was a low point for me. <laughs> because we hadn't made contact with anyone yet, and we thought, I felt like, we're not going to get out of here. No, where, how, would, how are they going to find us in a soccer field in the middle of Port-au-Prince, honestly? Pastor Val was feverishly trying to call. Julia actually had an international phone. And um, note to self, when there is an emergency, the phone company reserves the right to cut off your service, and they did. So that, that international phone was rendered useless. Um, so Pastor Val just continuing to try to call. We were trying to call Junior Patai because he was in Haiti. He's a Duke grad here. Um, I had his phone number, but couldn't get through to him. Finally, the phone rings. Pastor Val's cell phone rang. And it was some total stranger looking for Linda Graham. Uh, still to this day, do not know who this person was. But he, you know, he, we just said, hello, we're okay. And then it went dead. And about five minutes later, it rang again, and it was Wayne, Wayne Graham. And he, I think Wayne called 100 times. Kelly, uh, this is, let's let Wayne, because this is another part. While you gals were there on the front lines, there was a lot of family on the, on the back, back line in prayer and doing everything that we could do. And, and I tell you, honestly, you three ladies are loved beyond comprehension. I mean, it's really, I have no idea. So loved and, I mean, you know, we marvel at the wisdom of God in, in, in sending you guys. And, and I, I, I think that for, for me and I think many others, it's like Haiti has just never been on the map basically, and you guys have been forerunners 20 some years ago, going in there and, and building and planting. And now it's on, now Haiti's on everybody's map. And we're gonna pray for Haiti in a minute, but Wayne, my, my partner Wayne, brother, <laughs> oh my goodness, if you guys don't know Wayne Graham, Wayne Graham is, is the quintessential, I'm gonna make it happen kind of guy. And I thought if there's anybody who's going to be making a phone call into Haiti. It's going to somehow, Wayne is going to be connected with some satellite out of over Siberia and making contact through the back door some way. Wayne, I want you to share about that phone call and then also how you worked and how God helped to get them out of the country. Well, you know, the, <clears throat> the great philosopher Tom Petty once said, the waiting is the hardest part. <laughs> And, you know, really, that for the first 24 hours, it was tough. You know, I'm there looking at my kids, and you're having to look in their face, and you go, guys, it's going to be okay. Mom's going to be okay. And you have to stand with God and have to believe in Him at that time. You have to really, you're faced with that moment of, are you going to believe in me and believe what I can do or not? And so we had to declare, we're going to believe. So that first 24 hours, it was, it was tough. But there was a moment, Linda's mom and dad came up to help us. Ron Jacobson came over to the house. I want to really thank him for his friendship. We had been sending out multiple emails, multiple calls, multiple texts all over the world. Mm -hmm. Some guy got the telephone numbers for Pastor Val. I didn't even know the guy. He was the only one that made the call. He then called me and said, I just called through Pastor Val. I had literally tried 100 plus times to call that number for 24 hours, maybe more. 
And I remember we were all standing around the computer. We did it through Skype. And we did the biggest prayer of faith that that call would go through. I mean, you could just feel the, the anointing just kind of flow right through that phone line. In the name of Jesus, let this call go through. And it went right through. And they picked up the phone. And when we heard their voices, we just began to shout and praise God. <laughs> it was the greatest experience that I have ever felt in many, many years. So I realized at that point, once we made contact, that we had to figure out how to get them out. And so through a long series of events, the Lord showed us that there was an organization called Missionary Flights International based out of Fort Pierce, Florida, that they were trying to send relief flights in. And when they sent the flights in, then they wanted to be able to bring people out. Well, I just had this thought, if I don't get down there, and get in the face of these guys and let them know that these women are important. We need to get them out. It's not going to happen. So I flew down to Florida. I rented a car and I started to drive. And I mean, I literally, I left, I, I think I told my father-in-law, I got to go to the airport in an hour. And that was it. I had no money at all except a small amount of change that I had taken when I walked out the door. When I'm leaving there, the first thing I see is that in Florida, they had these crazy toll roads. And I saw there's a toll coming up. I thought, oh my goodness, I don't have any toll money. <laughs> Reached into my pocket, and I looked down. It was a dollar fifty toll. I looked down. I had a dollar, a quarter, a dime, two nickels, and five pennies. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Right then, I heard the Lord say, "I care about the details." And I tell you what, he cares about the details. So wherever, whatever you're dealing with right now, let me tell you what, he cares about your details. Yes. So I knew right then, somehow, yes. some way, God was going to make a way. He was going to work it out. It's not anything in me. It's yes. all in him. So when we got down there, the amazing thing was, Rick Hendrick of Hendrick Motorsports had donated three planes that day to this organization to fly relief people out. If you guys know Rick Hendrick, any of you NASCAR fans, he's the guy that has Jeff Gordon and Dale Earnhardt Jr. and his team. Well, the next thing I know, I'm sitting there and they've got a big Saab, nine, a Saab 2000 plane. There it is right there. They had this plane and they said, we're going to fly this plane over and with a group of rescue people and we're going to get your family out. And through another, we would need another hour and a half to five or 10, 15, 20 hours to tell you all that happened between, from that point to then. But by the grace of God, here they are. So. Amazing. <clears throat> it was such an outpouring at the, to jump ahead at the airport last night. And it was cards and flowers and hugs and tears it was it was so touching and it, and more than that is all the prayers prayer carried the day in this god answers prayer god cares when you pray he cares for you he cares for your cause he cares for your heart and just thank you so much for everybody that prayed thank you so much uh, kelly you want to you know, uh, just on a very personal note, the three of us right here, honestly, truthfully, are in a temporary poverty. Our businesses are failing. Things are just not good for us. And so for us to even go on this trip was a miracle. And I, I could spend all day telling you the series of miracles to get there. But I tell you, between the four of us, including Julia, we were able to, I, I feel like things just kept getting multiplied in our bags. We gave away all our band-aids, we were given away underwear, we were given away rubber gloves, but we had a doctor come to the house where we were staying eventually who needed medical supplies. They just like appeared places. We, you know, we were just culling things from our suitcases. We were handing out money. We gave this guy $40 and that person a couple hundred dollars. We gave Pastor Val like a thousand dollars before he left in cash because cash was king and there was no cash to be had. Gave him all these things we had taken. He went on his way back to the orphanage. We still haven't heard from him yet, so keep praying. Um, and then as we were leaving, we, we stayed with this missionary family and they, he needed to send his family out and they're desperately poor. I mean, they're living on faith completely and her parents are missionaries and they went to stay with them and they're poor and his parents are poor. So they didn't have anything. There were ladies in our church that gathered clothes together for these people, for their kids to have in the winter up here because it's not winter in Haiti. And we gave her a thousand dollars. So you tell me, where did that money come from? <laughs> 
<laughs> it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Kirk, I was so Im impressed. I just, just a second here, but I was so impressed when I spoke to you. Your unbelievable faith, I mean, just came through that. I was like, oh, Kirk's fine. Let's just, it's just, we're, it was really impressive. Uh, how did you get to that place of peace? This is before you heard from them. How did you get, how did you come to that place? Uh, the, the very first thought that went through my mind was, this is an incredible divine appointment. I mean, Kelly arranged this trip, you know, a month before she left, obviously not knowing there was going to be an earthquake there. But to think about the magnitude of what was happening in that country immediately following their arrival, I thought, this, God is all over this thing. This is phenomenal. You know, I met this woman in a third world country, and she's got the constitution and the iron will. And I thought, if there's anybody that can do this, Kelly can. And I said, as long as she's not in immediate danger, this is going to be a glorious testimony. And having lived there, I knew if they got out of the airport, and even if they were in the airport, that was fairly well built. But the chance of them being on the road when it hit was probably pretty good. So I thought they're probably not in immediate physical danger, and God is going to get a lot of glory out, this, out of this thing. And, th and that's the way it worked out. So I'm just thanking him for the peace that passes understanding and for the way he looked over our women that they could do what he sent them in there to do. The, the other footnote I want to make on this is as we prayed about this trip, the verse in the scripture that talks about um, Bethlehem being the least of these and how our prayer for Haiti for years has been, Haiti was so insignificant on the world stage. It was something that was not on anybody's radar. And now, today, it's on everybody's radar. So God's going to have his way in that country and there's going to be a glorious, glorious rebuilding in that nation and he's going to honor himself through all of it. Praise God. Praise you, God. So we are, we are going to be a part of, of a small part. I mean, Kings Park, what are we? we, 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 we we're not a, a Red Cross. We're not the United Nations. We're not UNICEF. We're just small. But you know what? It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Judah in the nation today because of our Kings Park ladies. Uh, there was a baby that got right. There's so many. We don't know how many lives you saved. Uh, many and the, the the witness of Christ and that great news. I mean, why won't the media tell the truth of that? They are there praising God right through their. I'm sorry. Everybody's walking around the streets like this. It's, yeah. Everybody, everybody, not just on that soccer field, but you walk outside and people are walking around with their hands in the air and praising the Lord and wa and praying and singing. I mean, it just went on and on for days. I mean, we left yesterday, so. They were still doing it yesterday. That's awesome. Yes. Um, I had a, before we started this trip, we were sitting in the airplane, the four of us, and I, we got all comfortable. I got my book out, and I was going to start reading. And on the very front page of the book, the Christian book, there was a scripture, and I read it. And I said, ladies, I said, I have the scripture for our trip. And I thought that it was going to apply to the, the Haiti people. But let me read it to you first and you understand. It's from Isaiah 42, 16. And it says, Along unfamiliar paths I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. Little did I know that God, that was the scripture for us because we were in a very dark place. We were in darkness, and we were in very rough places. And God did not forsake us. He, he met us every, when we need to move, if he, there's a story I can't tell you now, but we needed to move to a safer place, and he moved us. He, he said, go, and we did. So he was with us and guiding us. We thank God. Constantly. Thank God. There was not one moment on this trip where we could ever say, we made it because of so-and-so, or we made it because of this, or because of that. Every moment, honestly, we made it because of God. When we left the Raleigh-Durham Airport last Tuesday morning, bright and early, Lisa Lewis bought this bottle of water, and we drank this bottle of water, the four of us until water was found for us on Wednesday. And um, beyond that, I had eight granola bars in my bag, 
twice. I gave one to each of us. I gave some to the people that delivered the babies. I gave two to the doctor that came to the door that needed supplies, and then I still had some to leave at the missionary house when we left. The Lord woke me up in the middle of the night on that soccer field Tuesday night, which, by the way, was 24 hours of glory. I, I keep saying it was like I was in the very lap of God with the people praising and worshiping. The Lord woke me up and said, pray for the cisterns. Well, the word cistern doesn't really pop up in my vocabulary very often. And so I knew, okay, it's God. So I prayed for the cisterns. When we finally found the missionaries, they said, we don't know why, but our cistern has been spared. And the cistern at the school has been spared. So the Lord just did everything. We had given our jackets to these people who were unclothed and on the streets. I'd like to show you what the Lord used to keep Lisa Lewis warm on the soccer field. Nice. This is what the Lord, this is her blanket. Now, this that, is what kept her warm. That's, oh, that, it's that a hole virtual is for your blanket. Head. That hole is for your head? <laughs> <laughs> the hole continued to grow, but... Oh, you ripped it, okay. And, and we became that's the okay. best of snuggle buddies, but the <laughs> Lord's provisions were unbelievable. Well, the Bible does say when two lie down together, they shall keep warm. And we did. So... Uh, <laughs> I just did a wedding last night, and that was my verse. So anyway, that's how I knew that one. Well, guys, we're going to—we are—we're certainly—we're uh, uh, certainly going to do our part. Uh, we are right now um, not actively, but we are passively collecting funding for uh, for these relationships that we have, which is through you guys, and also uh, Junior Bataille is just legendary in this church, and he. Junior graduated from Duke, has been with us for many years. Reggie, Rollin, well, they'll come up in a second, uh, have a strong relationship with him. I have a relationship with Junior. He, he is saying that they have a church. Joseph Bataille, Gerard, is, Gerard Bataille is a major minister in, in the nation, and he's welcoming relief workers right now. He's not welcoming, I hate to say it this way, but he, they're not welcoming uh, you know, film crew and people who want to just come down and see what's going on. They are welcoming relief workers or medical help, people who are, know how to survive in these situations. So if, if that fits you and you have a way to get down, uh, I don't know what, what else to do except ask you, Wayne. This will, is what he was asking. I think what, he just sent that text. If you can, yeah, that's what this is, right. If you can work through the fire police departments and give us a, a search and rescue team, we have barracks for them. So if, if the media people who are here want to help us get that word out, we do have, and this is a very trusted, this is an amazing man, uh, uh, Pastor Bataille in, in Port-au-Prince. So we're, we're, that's what we're doing. We're raising funds to help in the, in the relief efforts, the rebuilding. Junior Bataille will be at Campus Harvest to give testimony. He will be here on our stage in, in March to share in, in the next, over the next two months, what God is going to be doing in Haiti. All of us can pray, some of us can give, uh, and that's basically, you know, what we're doing right now, and then, and then we'll have more updates from the Medis and Wayne and Linda and others as, as we go along. But ladies, we just thank God you're here. Uh, men of God, it's just been an awesome time this morning. Hi, this is Wayne Graham. I'm a board member of Strategic Global Initiatives, and you just got through watching an interview that included my wife, Linda. And uh, our family has been touched by this disaster in Haiti, and we're so committed to work together with the body of Christ, with our churches around the world, to make a difference in this nation. Right now, we're working with groups all over the world that are coming together to say, we can make a difference in this country. We're working with groups to provide doctors, humanitarian supplies, and a, just a massive effort to make an impact in that nation. I want to ask you to please go to the website address on the screen, learn more about what we're doing through strategic global initiatives, and together we're going to make a difference to impact the nation of Haiti. Thank you, and God bless you.